Hey everybody, welcome back to my channel. Today we are going to be discussing my master's dissertation. So in case you haven't been following along with the past couple videos, I've been going through all my time studying archeology span at university and my last video prior to this, which you should really go watch and will be linked in the description box below, is about my time studying for a master of science degree in human osteoarchaeology at the University of Edinburgh. In my previous video, I talked about the first two thirds of that, which was all of my coursework and time in classes from September to April 2013, 2014. And now we're going to continue and discuss kind of the last third of my time, which covers writing my dissertation from May to August 2014. For those of you who, are, who aren't aware, as a part of my master's degree and as a part of any master's degree, you have to write a dissertation. You can think of this as you want as a warm up for a PhD if you're planning on pursuing that, but it is basically a big paper that you have to write on a specific research project. It is a big complex thing to write. So once your classes end during a master's dissertation, you go from maybe thinking about it and starting to developing it to full on research for it until you hand it in. And they give you three months to do that. Well, I did okay on my dissertation. I did not graduate from my master's degree with a distinction, which is like the highest level that you can get, but I obviously passed. The mark that I got on my dissertation is the second highest level that you can get. So at my university, they had kind of four levels that your grade would fall within. One was that it was a fail, which honestly shouldn't really happen because throughout the process of writing your dissertation, you're supposed to be meeting with your supervisor, telling them what you're working on, discussing things, maybe sending them some drafts of certain parts of it to read, and they should be supervising you well enough to make sure that you are on the right path towards a pass. So the next level is borderline, which is that, you know, it's, it is enough to pass it, but it's like the absolute minimum, which is also what you shouldn't be aiming for. You should be aiming to get higher than that. The next level, is, which is the one that I fell within, is that it is a good performance. It's satisfactory for a master's degree. And then the highest level is that it is an excellent performance and you should not only be getting a master's degree with this, but also a degree with a distinction, which basically means that you did really, really well. So I have the actual copy of my dissertation in my possession. I got it back after it was marked and graded and it just sits on my bookshelf. I've obviously covered some personal information for the sake of the fact that this is going all over the internet. But the title of my dissertation was A Bioarchaeological Report and Cultural Analysis of the Greco-Hellenistic Skeletons from Mesembria, which I think sounds better than what it actually was, but maybe that's just me. So for those of you who are wondering what, where Mesembria is, it, this is actually an ancient name for a Greek colony on the Black Sea, which is now the modern day town of Nisabar in Bulgaria. And the reason why my dissertation was on the skeletal and archeological material from this particular place was because my dissertation master's supervisor had a project running at this place. And as a part of this project, she would let master's students write their dissertations on it. I, so I didn't necessarily need to go on field school to write my dissertation and there were people in my master's degree who didn't end up doing that because most of the data that I needed for my dissertation was already collected in spreadsheets, databases, and photos and they were just going to be adding to that when they went to Bulgaria so it might have increased the size of my sample that I was writing about but I didn't necessarily need to go as a part of being able to use that information, but I wanted to go. In comparison to my Jordan Field Schools, it was way cheaper. <laughs> Partially because A, I wasn't having to fly from Canada to Amman. I was going from Edinburgh to Bulgaria, which is I think maybe like a three and a half hour flight. The place that we were staying was a small little hotel that wasn't even really open for the season and while it got cleaned and everything, we were cooking all of our own meals. So we like rotated who was cooking every day. Everyone got a chance to do it. And it was only three weeks long instead of six weeks long. So all of that contributed to it being much less expensive. And so I decided to go. We ended up going in like early mid-May for about three weeks which was a really perfect time to be there because it was right before all of the holiday crowds descended on this particular part of the world, particularly all of the young students, I think mostly British, 
who go to Sunny Beach, because for those of you who haven't looked up where Nsebar is, it is across the bay sort of from this very infamous kind of party town known as sunny beach where a lot of kids end up going on very cheap holidays drinking a lot and spending time on the beach and it's a big party town so towards the end of the field school when tourism season was starting to kick off you could actually hear all of the music from all the clubs at sunny beach like echoing across the bay in a say bar at night and yeah i think it gets pretty wild there <laughs> during the summer but the period that we went was really nice because there weren't tons of tourists on the island, the weather was great, and we almost felt sometimes like we had the place to ourselves. So Nisebar itself is a really interesting place to visit. There's kind of two parts of it. There's the more modern part of town, which is set on the actual coastline of Bulgaria, and then there's a little island itself that is kind of like the old town that's connected to the mainland by an isthmus a made up bit of land, it's just a road. And the old town is quite interesting and a great place to visit if you're into heritage because it is actually like the entire islandy bit of the old town is actually a UNESCO World Heritage Site and has the highest amount of churches per capita, so like per person in the world. It's a very small island. You could walk from one end of it to the other in like a half hour, if that and there are churches everywhere. They're majority Byzantine era churches and most of them are very well preserved. Some of them are very famous, but they're everywhere. <laughs> so yeah, so it's quite an interesting thing to go visit and to go see all of the different churches that were built here and the entire place is a UNESCO World Heritage Site, as I said, which also has contributed uh, in a bit of a side note to a massive seagull problem. If you go there, be aware of the seagulls. It was never really explained in a way that made sense to me, but what I got told was that because it's a World Heritage Site and it's protected, for some reason they can't be really aggressive with culling seagulls, but the seagulls there are very bold. I have seen them dive out of the sky and steal pizza out of people's hands. <laughs> like if you put a piece of food down somewhere in the say bar, and look away from it, you look back, it's gone, the seagulls have taken it. They are, they are scary. Watch out for the seagulls. <laughs> so originally Nisebar was a Thracian town in antiquity. It then got taken over and named Mesembria by the Greeks and made into a Greek colony by the Greeks from the city-state of Megara. And it then went on to become a Hellenistic town colony and then a, uh, and then a part of the Eastern Roman Empire, etc. So my dissertation, as you could see from the title, particularly was concerned with the Greco-Hellenistic skeletal remains. The field school that I did was is very different from my previous ones that I did in Jordan in that it was entirely lab-based. So we were there to do osteoarchaeological analysis on skeletal material that had already been dug up by previous field schools and archaeologists. I'm not sure if they were entirely Bulgarian, but the material was already there for us to study, so that's what we were doing. We had a small museum on the island where we were set up, and we just kind of went there every day. We'd get a couple skeletons to look at. We would do analysis for age, sex, stature, pathology, etc. Enter it all into a database and then move on to the next. There were only eight of us on this field school. My supervisor, who is a lecturer at the University of Edinburgh, then we had two PhD students, and then there were five master's students with myself included in that number. Having a smaller field group was kind, was really nice and I have some really fond memories. We would listen to a lot of interesting music while we were in the lab during the day. Me and one of the PhD students would have competitions where we would like name an era and then I would pick a song of that era and then he would have to pick like a song that he thought was better and we were just like alternating between like just classic gems which was like absolutely great. One distinct memory I have as well is that the museum we were working in was next to a restaurant and because we were in the pre-tourism season this band was coming and practicing there almost every day as a warm up for when they did live shows during peak tourism during the summer. They weren't exactly the best band that I've ever heard and we heard the same songs every day for at least two weeks, I think. And I'll never be able to hear Purple Rain by Prince or Rolling in the Deep by Adele in the same way again because those were the two big songs that they were playing 
over and over and over and they weren't particularly good. In general, in the Sabar, it was a great place to visit. Everyone was so friendly and it was really cool to be able to live on this like tiny little seaside island where they had just all these little shops and you kind of got familiar with the place that you were living. There was a pug, I love pugs, uh, in particular that we would see walking around the island without an owner, owner every day so we got to always give him a little bit of a scratch and it was a great experience and I really enjoyed myself while I was there so I was really happy that I was able to go on that field school. So next I'm going to just read the abstract from my dissertation which is kind of the big summary of what it was all about and the conclusions I had because I'm not going to go through this whole thing for you. So my abstract reads Archaeology and the study of human remains have historically been presented in archaeological reports as separate entities. A bioarchaeological methodology has recently been developed to counteract this using archaeological, historical, and skeletal records to draw cohesive interpretations. These modern techniques are used herein to examine the classical Greek and Hellenistic skeletons from the site of Mesambria on the Black Sea coast. Characteristic demographic features, sex, age, stature, and paleopathology were observed and recorded for creating a tentative population profile. This was compared with the artifact and photographic results. A study was carried out to understand how well the occupants of Mesembria assimilated and practiced Greek culture by examining ex their funerary traditions. Actually, here's a, the first typo. I actually said, but examining their funerary traditions. It should be by. <laughs> Burial types, grave goods, and the skeletal data were compiled to look for common Greek funerary practices that have been detailed in the literature. A brief comparison to the nearby site of Apollonia Pontica was made for the same purposes. The data revealed that during both time periods, the occupants of Mesembria followed wider trends of Greek funerary culture during the Hellenistic period. The richness of the Hellenistic period artifacts also seems to indicate a period of economic prosperity in comparison to Apollonia Pontica. This aligns with historical records of this time where Mesembria became a preeminent colony of the Black Sea. No major deviations were found in the skeletal results, although the sample sizes were too small and poorly preserved to be considered representative of the whole population. There were no signs of widespread disease or nutritional deficiency. It was concluded that this population was assimilated into the Greek culture and practiced its traditions until the Roman conquest. So that's the fancy kind of outline for what I did. In general, I mean, it was pretty basic. It wasn't original. I wasn't trying to do anything groundbreaking. I even think versions of my been done have been probably written by students prior and maybe even after I did my master's. I really feel like my dissertation was just kind of the basics and th I'm not entirely unhappy with that. I had thoughts of trying to do other types of dissertations and other things. One point I was even thinking about trying to study Scythian human remain skeletal remains to try and look for any potential evidence of like Amazons or like a female warrior culture that was then made into the Amazons by the Greeks, which is a bit stupid when I think about it now. But I think with a lot of my ideas, they were just too big. They weren't things that I could fit within a three month research project. They were things that would have taken at least a PhD if I had even been able to get them off the ground, if they were even valid enough for research. Because just because you have an idea doesn't mean that it's something that you can build an entire research project out of and I definitely don't think the rest of my ideas were. So when I was trying to come up with a project I was kind of scrambling a bit and this kind of came along and I was like alright I can definitely write a dissertation out of this so that's what I'm going to pick. Once I finished the kind of data collection part of the field school we went back to Edinburgh and then I had the rest of the summer to write my dissertation. Now the actual bulk writing of it I would say took me a month to a month and a half so from June to around mid-July end of July which I think is probably less than some people would think but the writing part wasn't necessarily hard instead of writing it at home I actually ended up going to the University of Edinburgh graduate like computer lounge to write it. It helped me separate that space between like work and home which in some ways was a mistake because especially when I was editing in late July, early August, for anyone who's ever lived in Edinburgh, my school in that particular room where I was doing a lot of my writing on the computer is right by the quarter mile down to the meadows, which is where a lot of people and buskers set up 
during the summer to busk and make money, usually through music. So there was some interesting musical accompaniment to me writing my master's thesis, which I can't say I was necessarily grateful for or was particularly good because it was very loud and I was there for sometimes what, what the equivalent of like a full work day. After I finished the bulk writing of my dissertation, I then moved on to uh, having it edited and then typesetting it before I submitted it. Submitted it on August the 13th. I don't know if it was a, a week before or a couple days before, but it was early and in retrospect, maybe I should have taken an extra day or two to really give it one final once over, but hindsight's 2020. In total, I ended up with 15,844 words. Now the limit for my dissertation was 15,000, but this total number that I'm telling you is including, I think my abstract, my acknowledgements and my references. So the actual body of work itself ended up being about 14,900. That translates to about 66 pages. So much bigger than my big final undergraduate paper and much smaller than what you would expect most PhDs to be. I thought I was going to struggle for my word count in terms of having enough to write about and it ended up being the opposite where I actually ended up having too much to write about and then I had to kind of cut out and synthesize what I was saying, which for me actually kind of works better. I'm definitely the kind of person where I would rather have too much material and then have to cut stuff down than to not have enough and have to pad things. So in addition to the actual written body of work, I have a CD that's also included in my dissertation that is full of all my appendices. So these are all of my charts, my tables, my data that I was basing my entire thesis off of. If I had added that into my dissertation as physical copies, it would have made it much bigger, but nowadays putting it onto something digital, I think is a lot easier, simpler, and potentially better for the environment. <laughs> So I've got about four pages of references as well at the end. In terms of the general structure of, of my dissertation, I started off with an introduction which covered the aims of what I wanted to do, the limitations to that, you know, like I said in my abstract, I was very much limited by the sample size of the skeletons that I was looking at. I then moved on to a literature review. This is a pretty standard part of any kind of dissertation. You have to look at what's already been written. As I said before, I'm not sure if I'm the first person to write a dissertation in this way about this particular topic. I'm not sure if maybe previous students of my supervisor had done something similar, but none of them had been published, so <laughs> I couldn't really reference them. And within the hit literature review, I was mostly talking about the history of Mesembria itself, a very brief history of Greece in the classical period, same for the Hellenistic period, and then I was also covering Greek funerary culture. So what are the things that we know about how they treated their dead? My third chapter was my materials and methods. This just kind of covers what kind of data I had and what kind of methodology I was using to look at the skeletons and then the artifactual archeological remains. So the first three chapters are very much a large overview setting out what to expect, the history of everything, giving you a background before actually getting into what you're actually writing about. The fourth chapter was all my results. So this was going through the sex, age, stature, pathology, artifacts, and burial typology. And then within each of those little sections, I divided it between the classical and the Hellenistic remains. Once I finished giving you the results of all of the analysis that I did, I then started talking and discussing those results. In one chapter I was stating, all right, this is what I looked at and this is what I found. And then in another chapter I was actually talking about it and like, what does this mean? Or what does this reflect? So your results and your discussion are two very different separate things. My discussion covered all of those same factors in different sections separated for the classical, the Hellenistic, but I also added at the end of everyone a summary of everything all together. Then we move on to comparisons and conclusions, which is my final chapter. As I mentioned in the abstract, kind of part of this was comparing this to Apollonia Pontica, which was a nearby colony that's now the modern day town city of Sizopol. So Mesembria and Apollonia Pontica are very much associated together when you look at them in the archaeological record and history. So I thought it would be useful to kind of compare the two since they are so closely located together and often mentioned together. 
I then did a bioarchaeological report separating the classical and Hellenistic remains, closing remarks, and then references. So that was the basic structure of what I did. I'm not going to go really into more in depth about what specifically I covered because I could talk about that for ages. Interesting things from my dissertation that I thought were cool when I was writing it. Reading about changes or things that I, that I read about in like the historical records and then actually seeing that being reflected in the archaeological record. For example, the Lekithoi, which is a type of ceramic vessel that's usually included as a part of the burial goods. A trend from them being like very ornate and richly decorated to slowly being less and less decorated and also having like a different shape over time, that was a particularly cool thing to see. I think my biggest eureka moment of my entire dissertation, which is quite minor, is when I overcame a bit of a language barrier. So a lot of the artifactual data that was entered into a database that I was given was translated from Bulgarian into English, and when you translate stuff, it's never perfect. So there was a bunch of artifacts that I was looking at that were called clippers. And when I was looking at the photos of them, I was like, how are those clippers? I was thinking of them as like clippers, like like scissors for cutting hair. Like they didn't look in any way or shape or form like they could cut things. They basically looked like a long piece of metal with like a flat bit on the end that had been bent in half. And I spent ages being like, what are these? What does clippers mean? I asked my supervisor, she said she didn't know, but I suspect she didn't and she just wanted me to figure it out for myself. But one day I had a eureka moment where I realized that they're actually strigils, which are a like Greek hygienic instrument where, you know, they would lather themselves in olive oil and then they used a strigil to scrape it off. So I actually realized that instead of being clippers, these are actually strigils, which had been bent in half and placed in the grave goods. And that was my like, ah, moment and didn't end up actually being particularly significant, but I felt really smart when I figured that out. <sighs> my biggest mistake with writing my dissertation and handing it in early, I really should have gone through it one more time with a really fine tooth comb, but I think I had reached a point where it's like, I've looked at this so many times, I like can't look at it anymore and I'm, because I'm not seeing mistakes. But the biggest mistake that I came across in it was that I actually had some of the photos switched. So I had done a series where I tried to show the progression of the Lucky Thoi in the different styles throughout the ages and two of them had been switched places. The caption for them did not line up with the image at all and it was definitely noticed. It's mentioned on one of my reviewer comments. So I'm still annoyed that I missed that. I had two people proofread my dissertation before I handed it in. Both of them were my friends. One was a classmate, but he was doing a part-time degree, so he wasn't writing a dissertation, so I didn't feel bad asking him. So he gave a bit better feedback to do with the skeletal methodology. And then another one was one of my friends who was studying for a PhD in archeology. span So that was kind of more of an overview from someone who's a bit more experienced with writing and had written a dissertation already. So, so definitely recommend getting at least one proofreader for whatever you're doing because yeah, they'll see things that you never would have noticed. I also had my partner help me out by formatting the entire thing in LaTeX instead of Word. So LaTeX is a coding language. He offered to do this because he'd done it for a lot of his papers. He was familiar with doing it and he, the way he explained it, it would just make everything a lot more simple. For those of you who use Word, it can be quite complicated and it doesn't do things that you want it to. Whereas with LaTeX, you know, everything would always get automatically updated without me having to select it to be done. It, things would be automatically generated. And it was just, it did end up making my dissertation look really smooth and polished in my opinion. Not that anybody else really noticed but me, but I was quite happy with how it looked. But when he did this, he was away for some reason I don't remember. So we were actually, kind of communicating remotely. And I wouldn't recommend doing that. It's really difficult to communicate things in terms of like style or where stuff should be going via email or over the phone. It's a lot easier to do in person, at least in my opinion. So that's how my, so that's how my pictures ended up being screwed up is cause you know, I wasn't there to be like, this goes here and this goes here. And so he didn't do it correctly and I didn't notice. <laughs> so I definitely would recommend if you 
can learn a coding language for formatting papers, it's great. But otherwise, definitely, yeah, Word makes things difficult. Uh, if you're worried about things moving around, export it into a PDF for when you're going to go print it so that if wherever you're printing it has a different version of Word, then things don't get moved around. So two people ended up marking my dissertation, my, my supervisor, and then another reviewer from within the department. Both of them ended up giving me similar grades. They were only separated by 2%. The comments from my supervisor were that it was a good dissertation, it's well presented, it's got excellent diagrams, and that I met my goals of my dissertation. But the criticisms were that all the different strands of data that I had, the osteology, the artifacts, the archaeology, they stand alone and, and I didn't really integrate them together to create like a fuller picture. And my classifications and discussions on pathology are rather simplistic and superficial, could have been developed a bit further. She picked up on my problems with typographical errors and figure captions, particularly the switch of the two photos. That might have cost me a percent or two, but overall I don't think that that had a huge impact. Obviously I would like to have not made that mistake, but there's nothing I can do about it now, and I don't think that not making that mistake would have gotten me distinction, so eh. The other person that graded my paper was from the archaeology department. He wasn't involved in my actual degree and wasn't one of my teachers, but his conclusion was that it's a fairly standard osteological study, well written, clearly organized, makes good use of graphs, maps, and photos. However, he wanted me to include my sample sizes on my graphs and said that my percentages aren't very meaningful without some indication of the size of the population studied. And he doesn't want you to have to go back and trawl through the rest of the dissertation to find that information when you're reading it. Although there is a fair measure of critical appraisal within this th thesis, I found the degree of originality and independent thinking difficult to judge. Those criticisms are fair enough. For me, it's a bit difficult to write something really groundbreaking in three months. I mean, people have done it. There were other dissertations written at the University of Edinburgh that were stellar. They got published into papers, etc. But I've always been fairly average when it comes to my school, so that's probably about what I expected. My research isn't particularly original, but if I could at some point, I would maybe like to think about publishing it as a paper or something. Maybe I should just think about publishing it myself online so that anyone can access it if they want to. I'm not sure if I'm allowed to do that with terms of the data and the ownership of who owns all the stuff within my dissertation. And not because I think it's groundbreaking, but just because particularly when I was writing like the history of Mesembria and everything, like there's not a lot of sources that talk about it. It is very much a blip for a lot of people when they're writing about Greek colonies. So just to even contribute to the record about Mesembria and what's out there, I think would be pretty cool. I'd also love to be able to publish it in both English and Bulgarian because personally I think it's important to not only take that archaeology and publish it in my language, it should also be published in the language of the people of where that comes from because that's their heritage. But obviously I would have to probably go back and do quite a bit of work to turn this into something that's actually a paper that's worth getting accepted. Don't know if I have the time or want to particularly do that. I was pretty sick of it by the time I finished writing it. And I think that that has worn off in the time since, but I have a lot of other things to do. So I don't know if it'll ever make it to the top of my to-do list. Ultimately, if I could do it again, I would spend more time going through it with a more fine tooth comb to fix some of the stuff that I could have fixed, like all of the typographic errors and whatnot. But I don't think that I maybe could have ever gotten it to a distinction level because I just think that the base project wasn't distinction level. In my opinion, maybe I'm being overly critical of myself, it's kind of hard to know. I was overall relieved to finish it, I was happy with it when I turned it in, happy that I passed. So that's kind of my overview of my dissertation for my master's degree. As per usual, if you have any questions, comments, or concerns, please put them in the comment section down below and I will strive to answer whatever I can. If you like this video, please give me a thumbs up. If you'd like to see more from me, please check out the rest of my channel and give me a subscribe. Hit that bell notification button so that you get notified every time I put out a new video. Video. I have my social media down below if you'd like to follow me. Thank you so much guys for watching and I'll see you next time. Bye!